Welcome everyone to the third day of the session, uh, third day of the conference. Uh, the first session uh, is on anonymity, surveillance and tampering. And the first talk uh, will be on anonymous permutation routing by Paul Bunn, Al Krishlovitz, Rafael, and Rafael Ostrowski, and Paul will give the talk. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm presenting work with Al Kushlevitz and Rafi Ostrowski on anonymous permutation routing. Um, so just a brief outline of the talk, I'll introduce the problem, uh, the model, uh, give existing solutions, what was known before our work, um, a little bit of background, and then dive into uh, some an overview of the main ideas of our result. Um, so anonymous permutation routing is our result uh, in a model that was introduced by Xi and Wu in 21. It's called the non-interactive anonymous router model. Uh, and in the setting, you have n senders and n receivers. Um, they are connected, uh, so one receiver per sender via some permutation. And the senders have a stream of messages that they wish to um, relay to the receivers. Um, rather than peer-to-peer -peer links between senders and receivers, we assume the existence of a central router that will be responsible for all the routing. Um, so the senders send their messages to the router and the router uh, delivers them to the receivers. Uh, in terms of privacy, uh, there are two main things that we want to protect. One is the contents of the message, only the intended receiver should we receive its message. Uh, and the second is the permutation, who's talking to who. Um, and that will be the main challenge of the, the higher model, um, protecting the identities of, of the links. Oops. Um, and in terms of uh, formalizing the model of an adversary, we assume uh, honest but curious adversary static. Um, and in terms of who's corruptible, so the, the interesting work happens with the central router is corruptible, so the adversary will always be assumed to corrupt uh, the central router. In addition to that, some subset of the senders and receivers. Uh, and the specific subsets that are of most interest uh, in the basic collusion model um, the adversary can corrupt up to n minus two sender receiver pairs. So in particular, this means if, a, if the adversary corrupts the sender receiver pair plus the central router, uh, it's assumed that he can determine the linkage between that sender and receiver. So in particular, what the permutation does uh, between those two. Um, so if he can corrupt up to n minus two pairs, this means there's two senders and two receivers uh, that the adversary does not corrupt. And the permutation, what the permutation does on, on those two sets of senders and receivers should remain unknown. In the sender collusion model, um, in addition to the central router, all the senders are corruptible. Uh, and in this model, that the adversary still should not be able to learn um, uh, the permutation between the senders and the receivers for the non-corrupt receivers. Uh, and the receiver collusion model is just the inverse of that for the receivers. Um, let me talk about applications and applications that are particularly well suited um, to each one of these collusion models. Um, so I'm going to put up again the, a diagram. Um, arbitrary collusion, which, which we don't investigate, uh, is if the, if the adversary can corrupt um, the central router plus everyone except for two parties. Um, and I'll just notice that in the diagram, I've arranged this way because as you move down the layers of the diagram, um, the collusion becomes more difficult. So if you have a solution um, that is secure in one model, then you're automatically secure for the models above it. Um, so in the most basic collusion model, um, a relevant application would be peer-to-peer -peer messaging where you want to uh, keep private who is talking to who. Uh, for sender collusion model, um, some interesting applications would be uh, um, subscription, um, privacy subscription. So you want the receivers to privately subscribe to some channel. Um, and you assume that the senders perhaps can all collude with the central router and you should maintain the privacy of which uh, channel each receiver is subscribed to. Um, you can also think of multi-client peer or uh, like mailboxes as, as another application where sender collusion would be interesting. Um, so in this case, you have many receivers who are all subscribed to some mailbox, some index. 
uh, and the stream of messages is, is the mailboxes as they get updated with the messages. Um, for the receiver collusion model, this was actually the focus of the original NIR work by Xi and Wu in 21. Um, and one of the interesting applications of that, which we won't go into here, uh, is the non-interactive anonymous shuffle, uh, as well as the flip side of multi-client here and multi-client uh, writing. Um, and although we don't explicitly talk about it in our paper, um, you could also consider interesting applications where, uh, unlike the other models, the central router is always assumed to be corruptible by the adversary. Um, there may be some settings, for example, if this is used as a sub-protocol where each party takes turns acting as the central router, um, there may be interesting applications where you assume the central router is honest um, and then talk about what happens if some set of the other parties are corrupt. Um, an oblivious shuffle is something that you could get out of such a device. Um, so in our paper, we focus on the top and the left collusion models. Um, okay, so let me go uh, into some background of what was known before our work. Um, oh, so one, one thing I'll emphasize is that the messages are uh, message streams. So it's not just a single message that each sender wants to communicate to the receiver. Um, so as such, we allow at the beginning a setup phase. And in the setup phase, uh, the messages, um, it's like an offline phase, so we don't have the messages yet but we do have access to the permutation. So in the setup phase, for example, you can exchange keys. So each receiver could get uh, a decryption key that corresponds to some public key that is delivered to the corresponding sender uh, with respect to the permutation. Uh, so one naive solution to the NIR problem uh, is just to use flooding. So the senders all send their encrypted message to the central router and the central round router bundles them all up and delivers all N messages um, to every single receiver. But then the receiver has one decryption key and decrypts uh, exactly one of those messages, the one that's intended for it. Um, so this solution works. Um, uh, the encryption gives you the message privacy part of the security. And then the fact that it's just flooding um, gives you the privacy of the permutation. The problem with the solution is that it's not very efficient. Uh, it requires n squared total communication. Here n is the number of senders and receivers. Uh, and it also requires n squared work at the central router. Um, in order to reduce the communication, um, you could pose this as a peer problem. Uh, so still the senders all send their encrypted messages to the central router. Uh, the central router acts as a peer server. Um, so each receiver now sends a peer query that fetches, his, fetches the appropriate index um, that they're looking for. Uh, and the central router responds with the peer response. Um, so this solution benefits, you have reduced uh, communication from n squared to quasi-linear, uh, but it's still because peer is linear in the, the size of the database, uh, you still have n squared work of uh, the central router. Um, we saw some, some talks earlier uh, talking about how you peer can enjoy a offline mode um, to reduce the, the server computation time. Uh, in this setting, that doesn't work because the messages are not fixed. It's a stream of messages. Every round is a new message. Um, so it would require doing the setup over and over again. Uh, and you wouldn't end up seeing the enjoyment uh, of the reduction of n squared computation at the central router. Uh, and finally, in the original work that introduced this model uh, by Xi and Wu in 21, um, they had similar metrics as just using peer with, with quasi-linear communication, um, n squared computation. Uh, one benefit over the peer model is that their solution gives you protection against receiver collusion, um, which is one of the, the adversary collusion models um, that we don't go into. Um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, and actually, uh, as concurrent work, there's a follow-up to uh, Xi and Wu's uh, original paper that will be presented immediately after me by Nikhil. Um, and uh, just quick comparison, I won't go into the details of their work because I don't know them exactly and because they'll be presenting it, um, but just a quick comparison of what, what they attempt to do and what we attempt to do. So first we consider different collusion um, models. We, while we focus on the top and the left, uh, they focus on the right and namely the receiver collusion. Um, they have similar performance results and that 
things are quasi linear, which is as, as well as could be expected. Um, but in order to get protection against receiver collusion, which appears to be the more challenging uh, protection to provide, they need to use results from obfuscation. Um, okay, so the motivating question that we had when we entered, um, when we started investigating this problem was, was there a solution in the NIR model that gave you, that reduced the naive solutions from N squared uh, computation at the central router um, down to quasi-linear, which is as best as can be expected? And furthermore, can does a solution exist under standard cryptographic assumptions? Um, so obviously, if this question's up, the answer to these questions is yes. Uh, before I state the, the theorem statement, um, just some quick background. So rate one OT uh, was introduced by Dutley and et al. Uh, in 2019. And it's rate one OT and rate one peer um, are just like standard OT and peer variants, except the server response is basically the same size as the messages of the peer database, uh, some constant stretch. Uh, and this will be important for our results. Um, so our theorem, assuming rate one OT, um, which is, oh, I, I forgot to mention, it's uh, you can get, based on these results from Dotlane et al. and, and others, uh, there are known instantiations of rate one OT and rate one peer based on DDH, QR, and LWE, so very standard assumptions. Um, so our theorem, assuming rate one OT, there is a solution to anonymous permutation routing against the honest but curious static adversary uh, who's allowed to corrupt central router uh, and, and under the sender collusion model um, and basic collusion models uh, that achieves our quasi-linear results. Uh, I just have a couple minutes, so I just wanna give some high-level ideas to our solution. Um, so as our title, anonymous permutation routing suggests, uh, our result is based on some ideas from permutation routing. So what is permutation routing? Permutation routing without anonymity is you still have N, N senders and N receivers Again, they're not connected by peer-to-peer -peer links, but rather they're connected via some routing network, which you can think of as like a sorting network. Um, and just like in the expander graphs talk we saw yesterday, these permutation networks have some special properties um, that are apply nicely to our setting. And in fact, we think that perhaps these permutation networks might be useful in other cryptographic results as, as a building block, just as expander graphs were yesterday. Um, so the idea is the network is fixed ahead of time and you don't know what the permutation is. Um, and then once the permutation comes in, you choose random paths that respect uh, that permutation. So you go through the various center receiver pairs and pick paths. And the idea behind permutation routing networks, good ones, they're small, which means overall uh, quasi-linear or polylog depth. depth. Uh, and also with high probability, you want the paths that you select to not collide so that you can successfully route messages without collisions. And so that's called an edge disjoint property. Um, and our observation is that because these networks are small, even though we don't have actual networks, we can have the central router emulate uh, the routing network. Um, and the key problem here is uh, because the permutation needs to remain hidden, if we're gonna have a single party, the central router, which is corruptible, uh, emulate it, then he needs to make his routing decision uh, without knowing what he's doing. And so we create an, the notion of an obfuscated gate, uh, which allows the central router, you can think of it as acting as a little mini peer server for every node in the routing network, um, where we, he obliviously takes messages on the incoming wires, flips them around, permutes them, and outputs them. And so the actual values that get written are the peer pairs. Um, so this slide just overviews uh, how these results or how these ideas are put together. One final comment I'll make is that uh, the edge disjoint property of permutation networks is not quite enough. We had to prove a little stronger result to actually guarantee uh, security in our anonymity proof. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? So I had a quick question. Um, so is there any restriction that you're, uh, you know, you're restricting to permutation is that a real restriction or could you handle routing which is not permutation um yeah so the the in terms of the metrics uh you'd have to you know the you have end senders and end receivers we do use permutation 
routing networks, uh, which have nice properties for permutations. So depending on what you're trying to do, you could certainly do other things. One thing we thought about is, you know, you can view you can view the the end party thing as actually two parties, and each party is is representing has n bits of information or a database in size n. Um, so that there are different things you can play around with. You can also uh, generalize the model a little bit instead of each receiver exactly subscribing to say to one receiver or one sender it subscribes to some group of them and you can play around with different concepts. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, next uh, talk is on non-interactive anonymous router with quasi-linear router computation by Rex Fernando Elin Shi. Pratik Soni, Nikhil Vanjini, and Brent Waters, and Nikhil will give the talk. Hello. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Nikhil, and I'll be presenting our work on non-interactive anonymous router with quasi-linear router computation. This is joint work with Rex, Elaine, Pratik, and Brent. So let me start with introducing the non-interactive anonymous router model. As you just heard about it, um, there are n senders in this setting, S1 to SN, N receivers R1 to RN, which are, uh, there's a one to one mapping between all of them, which can be represented as a permutation pipe. And the goal is that we want to route messages from the senders to the receivers via a single untrusted router. And it needs to be done in a non interactive way while preserving some kind of anonymity. There are four algorithms in this scheme. The setup is done by a trusted third party, which gives some uh, sender keys to each sender. Each receiver gets a receiver key, and the router gets a routing program. Then what the senders can do is they can use the sender keys to encrypt messages and send to the router. The router can run the routing program on the sender ciphertexts and obtain some receiver ciphertexts and forward them to the appropriate receivers. Lastly, they can uh, decrypt the messages using the receiver keys. So in this model, uh, let's look at what anonymity means. We study receiver inside the protection. Over here, what we want is that the adversary uh, should not be able to learn the honest senders of corrupted receivers. Let's understand this by a simple example, where the adversary corrupts the router, all the receivers, and all but two senders. So when you corrupt the sender, adversary is allowed to learn the receivers as part of inherent leakage. And consider for a simple case that the permutation is just an identical mapping, I to I. So if you corrupt S3, you learn it's communicating to R3, and so on. S4 is communicating to R4, SN is communicating with Rn. Now, the challenge is if you now corrupt R1 and R2, we want to somehow ensure that you still can't learn that who S1 and S2 are talking to among these two receivers. And we want to protect this. So a quick comparison with uh, what was just presented. Uh, the sender inside the protection is uh, the dual of receiver inside the protection. Over there, you want to protect anonymity of receivers if you start corrupting some senders. And uh, what we know is near with RIP is comparable to multi-client functional encryption with function hiding security, which is known from standard assumptions on pairings. Further, near with SIP is comparable to private information retrieval, as you just heard, and which is known from standard assumptions without pairings, such as uh, DDH, QR, LWE. So from a technical viewpoint, it seems that achieving receiver inside the protection is a bit more challenging than sender inside the protection. Okay, so it's challenging, but why do we care about studying receiver inside protection? Uh, the idea is that it is very suitable to study non-interactive anonymous shuffler. In this setting, we have a single untrusted shuffler who receives messages from n senders, and it wants to shuffle the messages and just uh, learn what the output is. And we want to uh, for anonymity, what we want is the shuffler should not learn which message comes from which sender. And this shuffler setting can be instantiated using near as follows. The shuffler can uh, run the tasks of the router as well as all the end 
receivers are on top of that. So uh, this enables doing shuffling. But uh, the key observation over here is this requires receiver insider protection because the shuffler has all the receiver keys and we are trying to protect anonymity of the senders. And sender insider protection is insufficient for this scenario. Now, having motivated uh, why do we care about receiver insider protection, what do we know about it? So the work of Xi and Wu showed how to uh, build such a near scheme that O of n uh, communication and O of n square router computation. And they built it from decisional linear assumption on bilinear maps. So key observation over here is if we did not care about anonymity, then there's a straightforward solution. The senders can just send the messages to the router, which can apply the permutation and forward the messages to receiver. So you can do it in order and router computation if we did not care about anonymity. So there's this gap. And the question then is, can we build near schemes with subquadratic router computation? So we try to answer this question uh, and we achieve some results as follows. We obtain order n log n communication and n polylog n router computation. So essentially just paying a little in communication, we can drastically bring down the router computation from n squared to quasi linear. And we note that this is near optimal. We built it from one-way functions and indistinguishability obfuscation. And just to note, uh, in the previous talk, you heard about near with sender insider protection. Uh, they achieve similar results. They obtain n polylog and router computation, but that's in the sender insider setting, which are uh, is incomparable to receiver insider. And the applications, as you heard, are also different. So the roadmap for the rest of the talk is going to be as follows. I will first present a straw man construction based on a single line program. This straw man will have poor router computation because it will obfuscate a very large program, but it will give us some insight of how our main construction works. And then I will present the main construction. What ideas do we need for that? And intuition of what challenges we face while building security. So let's start with obfuscation. In distinguishability, obfuscation provides a way to obfuscate a program P into an obfuscated version I of P. For functionality, we want that uh, on any input, the two programs should output the same value. And for security, we want if two programs P and Q are functionally equivalent, then their obfuscations should be computationally indistinguishable. And there has been a lot of work uh, studying indistinguishability obfuscation, and recently Jane et al. showed how to build it from well-studied assumptions. So how can we use a single I.O. program to do the near task? Suppose that the senders and receivers have some encryption decryption keys. Then to the router, we can provide the obfuscation of the following program. This program hardwires as secrets the permutation pipe and all the sender and receiver keys. And the program is very simple. We just decrypt all the ciphertext using sender keys, apply the permutation on these messages, and encrypt uh, using the receiver keys and just output these cipher bits. So what can we say about this? Uh, while we don't know if this uh, would be secure or not, the main problem that we come across is uh, it has poor router computation because the known IO constructions incur poly blow up and evaluation time. And over here, the original program uh, takes O of n time because there are n cipher tests you are uh, executing on. So clearly this IO program will run in poly end time, which the router needs to execute, and this is bad. So how can we go about solving it? The idea is instead of obfuscating a single large program, we will obfuscate a lot of small programs. And these programs will be gates in a routing network. So let me tell you about uh, our construction next. Let's start with what's the routing network. Over here, I will just consider four senders and receivers, and the ideas generalized to me n. Apart from senders and receivers, there are some intermediate nodes in this routing network, denoted by i. And messages are routed from senders to receiver via these multiple layers, and the gates perform the routing. The nice properties of routing network are that all receivers are reachable from every sender, as can be seen by these paths. And what this helps with is we can, in, that, in fact, uh, simulate the permutation pipe using this routing network. 
So over here, the four senders are mapped to different receivers via these four disjoint paths. Uh, we can observe that simple routing networks are not anonymous. Uh, consider that we just corrupt two senders, S1 and S4. Because the adversary is allowed to learn their receivers, it learns the two red paths taken by them. Then it can infer that uh, the honest sender S2 is communicating with R3 because there's a unique path. So this is clearly not anonymous. So how can we solve it? The idea is if we introduce some filler wires in this routing network, then we can hope for some kind of anonymity. The filler wires don't contain any messages. They just have some dummy messages that they are routing. So what happens now? As before, you learn the messages uh, for the corrupt, the paths for the corrupt senders. But now for the honest sender S2, you learn that it can be taking one of the three possible intermediate nodes in the first layer. And usually all these uh, wires feed into both the gates, gate 21 and gate 22. And as a consequence, in the last layer, all possible wires apart from the corrupt wires uh, could be where S2 is routing. And thus, adversary can't infer if S2 is sending to R2 or R3. So using these filler wires, we can hope for some kind of anonymity. And our construction then is as follows. What we do is obfuscate each of these gates uh, in the routing network and provide all the gates to the router. And the, what the router does is, for routing, it emulates this whole network on its own, meaning it obtains these four ciphertexts, two from senders, two filler ciphertexts, applies the obfuscated gate 1-1 one, one on them to get four intermediate ciphertexts and so on for each of the gates in the nearby their gate. And, okay, we can hope for the router to emulate this task, but uh, there's a problem. If the router does not emulate it correctly, it can do some mix and match in between and maybe it breaks some anonymity. So how do we go about fixing this? We need to do some kind of authentication checks in this. And our gates then are as follows. We first decrypt to obtain some signed messages, verify some signatures, confirm the messages, sign the messages, and re-encrypt the signed messages. So now we want to do some authentication of this kind inside all these gates. Let's look at uh, the efficiency of this construction then. In this routing network, there are n login gates, where each gate is now poly login size. As a consequence, even after obfuscation, it's some other polynomial, but still a poly login. And the router computation then is n poly login. So this meets our efficiency requirements. Uh, let me quickly give you an uh, idea of what are the challenges. We know that uh, obfuscation is difficult to work with, uh, with the for the building blocks that we are using, and we need uh, some kind of function-based techniques. And over here, what we need is uh, somewhere statistically unforgeable signature scheme, which has normal and a binding mode. In the binding mode, the signing key should be such that no messages in some set X can be signed, and no valid signatures exist for messages in a set X or verification key. This means that there is some statistical unforgeability on some points specifically the set X. And further, we require a strong property for security. We want that binding signing key and normal verification care computation be indistinguishable from binding signing and binding verification keys, which is not satisfied by any of the previous punishable signature schemes. And a key contribution is showing how to build this CC signatures from one functions. Just a quick uh, note on additional results. We also initiate the study of adaptive corruptions, and we show that we can perform near with uh, adaptive corruptions for senders and receivers uh, for indistinguishability style security. Particularly, we show a compiler which upgrades any near scheme secure against static to near secure against adaptive corruptions. And this is a generic compiler. It works for receiver inside the protection, sender inside the protection, and differential anonymity as well. Further, we show that simulation security is impossible to achieve, and we show this via a compressing argument. Lastly, if there's one thing that you want to take away from this talk, it should be the comment that IO is not only a tool to build complex cryptographic primitives, but it can also be used as a way to boost efficiency of systems, as I just demonstrated. And then there are some natural open questions after this. One is, can you build efficient near from standard assumptions without using I.O.? And more interestingly, 
can the network of IO approach be used elsewhere? Like, can you build more applications beyond this routing task? And even more challenging is, can you boost efficiency of IO itself with uh, such an approach? And with that, I will leave. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. Since uh, we're out of time, maybe the next speaker can set up and there's a question while the next speaker sets up. Okay, let's uh, thank Nikhil again. The next talk uh, is on low bounds on anonymous whistle blowing by uh, Willy Quach, Lakia Tyner, and Daniel Wicks. And Lakia will give the talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lakia Tyner, and today I'm presenting lower bounds for anonymous whistleblowing. This is joint work with Willy Quach and Daniel Wicks. So let's start by introducing the setting for the anonymous transfer. Here we have a group of friends who are participating in some public conversation over Twitter or Facebook. Here they have a conversation about bunnies. Here each friend is sending a message through their public accounts. And so Alice can see all the messages that were sent by Bob. Freddie can see all the messages that were sent by Cecilia and so on and so forth. In this case, we have one friend who wants to transmit some secret message, possibly completely unrelated to bunnies, Let's say, for example, the secret Krabby Patty formula. And they want to do this possibly without the knowledge of their friends and also especially without revealing their identity. And so in order, in order to do this, they send particularly crafted bunny messages such that later on when the conversation has ended, anyone who has access to this public transcript of the conversation can then go back and recover the secret message and do so without realizing that Alice was the one who sent the secret message. A protocol in this particular model is ideal for facilitating whistleblowing. This is because it's likely that the whistleblowers are acting in an untrusted environment. And so if they're identified, they run the risk of facing harsh punishment. And so a natural question that we can ask and one that is studied in prior works is can we mitigate this risk using some cryptographic techniques? Anonymous transfer was initially introduced last year by Agricola, Couteau, and Meyer. And this particular model is novel in this situation because it doesn't rely on any trusted parties beyond the non-centers generating some dummy traffic. On the other hand, all other works on anonymous communication require that the trusted parties actively participate in the protocol. And so a technical detail about this anonymous transfer model is that we can model the dummy messages as uniformly random messages. And this is without, without loss of generality since we know how to embed uniform randomness in other distributions. The ACM22 paper has two particular results. The first is a positive result which states that on one end of the spectrum, we have a very weak form of AT that is, a pos that is possible. And on the other end of the spectrum, on the other side of the spectrum, we have a very strong form of anonymous transfer that is impossible. And so this leaves a big unknown gap in between these two results. And in this work, we show that we can close this gap by extending the negative result. And this will in turn show that their weak, their very weak form of anonymous transfer is the best that we can hope for. Before we more, more closely describe our results, let's look at anonymous transfer. It is a protocol with C rounds involving two parties, a sender and a non-sender. And as an aside, the lower bounds in a two-party two -party setting imply lower bounds in the end-party setting as well. The AT algorithm, algorithm include a trusted setup algorithm, which outputs a CRS, a transfer protocol, which takes as input a secret message, which we hope to transmit, which call this mu, and then outputs some, tr some transcript of the conversation. And then we have a reconstruct algorithm, which takes as input that transcript and then reconstructs some message mu prime. We also have the correctness property, 
which states that for all messages mu, the probability that mu prime is not equal to mu is negligible. Additionally, we have this delta anonymity, which describes some distinguishing advantage and basically says that for all PPT distinguishers and all messages mu, the probability that the distinguisher outputs one, and we're looking at a transcript pi A, where A is the sender, and another transcript pi B, where B is the sender, is less than or equal to delta. So let's compare our results. The negative result of the ACM22 paper states that we cannot get a negligible an anonymity delta against all polytime addresses. And then their positive result states that it is possible to build an AT with anonymity delta equals one over the number of rounds, but only against fine grained adversaries whose runtime is a factor of O of C larger than the runtime of the honest partners. This unfortunately relies on some strong assumptions such as ideal obfuscation. And so the gap between these two results, these open these questions. Can we get a decent anonymity against all polytype adversaries, even though we can't get negligible anonymity? And can we get a negligible anonymity against fine grained adversaries, um, even if we can't get it against all polytype adversaries? In this result, we in this in this paper, we show that no, we can't get either of these things. More particularly, our first negative result says that we cannot get security against all polytime adversaries with any non-trivial anonymity that's less than one. And then our second, our second negative result shows that we cannot get negligible anonymity, even in the case where we're considering fine-grained adversaries. Okay, and so we present our results in the form of designing attacks against the anonymity of an anonymous transfer protocol. The goal of these attacks is, of course, to, given the transcript of the protocol, identify who the sender is. And so in order to do this, we consider some notion of progress towards correctly recovering the message, particularly progress associated with a partial transcript pi i, where the first i messages of pi i are equal to the first i messages of pi, and the remaining messages are uniformly, are uniformly, uniformly random the same. We then conjecture that the party who has made the most progress towards ensuring that the message is correctly, re correctly recovered is the actual party who sent the message. Okay, and so we have pi r, pi i to be defined as the probability of correctly returning the message or recovering the message after the i message has been sent, and we associate this with pi i. Let's take, for instance, the case when party I has sent the ith message, party A has sent the ith message. We wanna assign the progress made between PI of PI minus one and PI to that party. And then the main insight that we will use in our attack is that the non sender messages do not on expectation change the value of PI. This is because the probability that a random message increases correctness is low. And so the blueprint of our attack is as follows. First, we will es estimate each party's contribution. And then we're gonna argue two things. The first thing is that the contribution of the non-sender is small. And secondly, the total contribution is large. And so that means that the party who contributed the most must be the sender. And then we abstract our, in, our blueprint into what we call a covert cheating game which is a game between two players who alternate updating the state of this game. In this case, we have the position of the dot along the line as the state of the game. We have one player, which we call the bias player, whose purpose is to push the state of the game closer to one. And then we have a non-biased player who's restricted to making only moves that cannot on expectation change the state of the game or change the position of the dot along the line. We have this third player who we call an observer who is given the state of the game at each point from P0 to, P, to PS. And using these points, they're trying to determine which player is the biased player and which player is the non-biased player. 
And so the main fact that we will use in our attack or in our insight is that the non-player again cannot change the state on expectation. And so this means that if PI is close, PI minus one is close to zero in PI, that means that PI cannot um, very well be far from zero in this case. And we show that this follows by mod pop. Considering this, this means that the we want to weigh the progress made closer to zero higher. And this will signal to us that the progress, that if a player made larger progress close to zero, then that player is likely to be the sender. And so for this, we consider a multiplicative form of progress. So from PI to PI minus, PI minus one to PI, we have this ratio, which is equal to PI over PI minus one. And so this means that the total progress is the product of all these ratios, which is equal to the final, um, the final state divided by the initial state. Again, since the total progress made is equal to the final state over the initial state, it must be the case that one player has a total progress greater than or equal to the square root of PF for P0. And so let's consider N to be the set, the set of indices for the non-biased player. Then since the total contribution for the non-biased player on expectation will be equal to one, by Markov, this means that the probability that the total expected contribution or the total contribution made by the non-biased player is greater than or equal to the square root that we saw earlier is going to be less than or equal to the square root of P naught over PF. And then we're gonna use this intuition in order to generate or in order to design our attack. So the high level insight is first, we're going to estimate each PI. Then we're gonna compute the contribution of each player. And then we're gonna declare the biased player to be the one who has a contribution greater than or equal to P five, the square root of P final over P naught. So in summary, the ACM22 paper has a positive and negative result, which has a large gap between the two results. This work closes that gap by extending the negative results. And in particular, we show that we cannot get security against all polytime adversaries for any non-trivial anonymity. And we also cannot get negligible anonymity, even in the case where we're consider, considering fine-grained adversaries. And this will again imply that their positive result is the best that we can hope to get. So I'm gonna end with two open questions. The ACM 2022 feasibility result relies on ideal obfuscation. And so the question here is, can we construct this under more standard assumptions? And then finally, our covert cheating attack unfortunately runs in a fairly large polynomial. And so the question here is, what can we do to improve the runtime of this attack? Any question? Okay, well, there are no questions. Let's uh, thank Lakaya again. So the next talk uh, is on multi-instance randomness extraction and security against bounded storage mass surveillance by Jiaxin Guan, Daniel Wicks, and Mark Shandri, and uh, Jiaxin Guan. Thank you, Chair, for the introduction. Hi, my name is Jiaxin Guan, and today I'll be talking about our work, multi-instance randomness extraction and security against bounded storage mass surveillance. It's a really long title. Uh, but don't be scared. Uh, I'll begin with a very simple example. So over this talk, I will be I will not be touching the technical details, uh, but uh, we'll briefly talk about like what we actually did. In here. So uh, in cryptography, our favorite friends, Alice and Bob, and let's say here they're not doing something super crazy. They're doing a very simple thing. So Alice sends over an encrypted document over to Bob. Okay, and you know we can never have an interesting security game with our other friend Eve. And Eve comes along and doesn't do anything super malicious yet. But what Eve will do is it will eavesdrop on the channel and while the message, while the encrypted message is being transmitted, make a copy of the second. Okay, that's all Eve will do for now. Doesn't do anything malicious yet, uh, anything super malicious yet. And then Eve will just wait and wait and wait until at a later time, when Eve was somehow able to get the decryption key used by Bob. 
you can think about you get this through a security breach or maybe through a physically interrogating Bob or by maybe hacking Bob's computer. But anyhow, the adversary gets, uh, gets hold of the decryption key. And now what the adversary can do is can simply use the decryption key to decrypt the ciphertext that it has written down and therefore uh, retrieve the original secret message that Alice sent to Bob. Okay, so to prevent against this, what we need is what we call forward secrecy. And essentially saying that a secret key uh, com compromised in the future should not compromise the security of the messages sent. But in, uh, but in, but in, but in the standard model, achieving forward secrecy is actually a very, uh, is very tricky. We will either require the honest parties to run a multi-round protocol, meaning that they will need to interact in order to send a, send a, send a message, or we will require the, the receiver, Bob in this case, to constantly update their, their decryption keys. And both, the, both of these could be undesirable uh, under many settings. So what can we do? So one, one important observation here is that this attack pretty much relies on Eve storing the ciphertext. So the question is, what if the adversary cannot store the ciphertext at all? And how do we actually make that happen? Now imagine in this setting, Again, we have our friends Alice and Bob, but in this case, Alice sends over a huge ciphertext to Bob. So it is a, it's a very large ciphertext that exceeds Eve's storage, okay? So when Eve comes along and sees the ciphertext, what Eve can do is can only write down only a portion of the ciphertext, but not the ciphertext in its entirety. And then the transmission is gone, and at a later time, when Eve got, gets back the, the, private, the private key, the private key but because Eve not only has a small portion of the ciphertext, maybe if we design the, design, the, design the encryption scheme in a clever way, we can have that Eve actually gets no information about the message at all. This is exactly what's studied under incompressible encryption. Notice that uh, this, uh, so incompressible, you can imagine there are two flavors where you can imagine incompressible symmetric encryption. That was studied by Zimbowski back in 2006 under the name Forward Secure Storage. And later on uh, in our prior work, we formalized this, uh, these ideas and we present incompressible PKE. And we, will, uh, and we say, okay, Zimbowski's constructions actually uh, can be categorized as an incompressible SP. So the idea about incompressible encryption is that the ciphertext, we make them intentionally huge so that exceeds the adversary's memory, so that adversary cannot possibly write it down. So in that sense, even if later on, we give the adversary the decryption key, the scheme is still secure. Notice that this is impossible in the standard model because if the adversary has a decryption key, the adversary can do, do whatever uh, it wants and decrypt the original messages. But here there's one very, uh, one caveat about incompressible encryption is that it necessarily it will require the ciphertext to be, uh, to be much larger than the adversary storage, okay? So imagine the following scenario. Alice is just sending over a single message, just saying hi to Bob. It's just uh, three characters. But in order for it to be encrypted under the incompressible encryption scheme, it will need to be blown up to a huge ciphertext, at least gigabytes or terabytes of data. So this is hugely um, undesirable in a, in a real world application. So our question is, is there any, any scenario or any security definition that actually makes sense or like would make this incompressible encryption more usable? So now imagine this case. Imagine now Alice sends over uh, the ciphertext is much, much smaller. It's actually smaller than what an adversary can store. But imagine that in the entire system, there are many, many users sending over a huge collection of these, uh, these ciphertexts. So each individual ciphertext can be small and the adversary can possibly write it down. But if we consider the entire aggregation of the ciphertext, it exceeds the adversary storage. And the adversary, uh, the adversary can only store a very small portion of it, okay? So in this case, we imagine we have some adversary that is trying to do mass surveillance on the entire population. And here we assume that, okay, so the adversary has a storage when it compared to the total number of, uh, total number of uh, aggregation of the ciphertext, it's only a very small percentage, let's say 1%, okay? So at the end, when the adversary later on is able to get all of the private keys, all of the decryption keys, we want to say that okay, if you only have around one percent of the of the of the of the memory storage for the ciphertext, then you can only break approximately one percent of the of the ciphertexts. 
Okay, and in other words, the other the other ninety nine percent should remain secure. So in other words, if we think about it the other way, if at a later time an adversary decides, hey, I want to attack Bob's uh, Bob's ciphertext, well, all it can do is to hope for that when the transmission happened way back, it has actually written down Bob's ciphertext, and that only happens with probability one percent, assuming that all of the all of the parties uh, is indistinguishable to the to the like all of the because the because the adversary don't know who will be the person of interest in the future. So how do we actually construct this? For, uh, to, to construct that one very intuitive way is to, hey, maybe we modify one of the prior constructions of incompressible encryption. So what are the previous constructions? There's the construction of SKE, incompressible SKE by Zimbalski in 2006, and we constructed incompressible PKE back in 2022. And um, Branko, Dutling, and Dwimovic, they show that uh, you can actually get an incompressible SKE with a rate of one. Here, the rate meaning the, the size of the cipher size of the message compared to the size of the ciphertext. So that by a rate one, it's really efficient that your message can be almost as long as the ciphertext. And they also and we also show a rate one incompressible PKE where we have a smaller public key. And uh, Br uh, Branko et al. They also show a incompressible PKE with a rate of one, but with longer public keys. But in there, their uh, assumptions are much weaker. We notice that among the center of all of these constructions, there's one central piece that's needed. They all use a seeded extractor. A seeded random extra randomness extractor is used in all of these constructions. So now imagine if we want to, want to, want to the, want one of the incompressible PKE or incompressible SKEs to be secure across multiple instances, then necessarily what we want is a randomness extractor that is secure across multiple instances. So how do we actually capture this definition and how do we actually construct such a, such a, uh, such a multi-instance randomness extractor? That's the, one of the co core technical tools that we explored in this paper. So our core technical result is a, what we call a multi-instance randomness extraction. So the scenario we imagine is as follows. So we have an extractor that is run multiple times, in this case, t times, on different, on different sources and different seeds. Notice that the sources here, they can be, they can be arbitrarily correlated, okay? And uh, the extractor outputs, let's say here we call them ones. So the sources can be correlated, but what we require is that if we look at the joint, uh, we, if you look at the joint distribution of these sources, we say that, okay, we don't assume anything about any specific source, but let's say if we look at the joint distribution, they have a joint main entropy rate of alpha. And then what we were trying to say is then, okay, if that is a the case, then if we look at all of the extractor outputs, we wanna say that approximately an alpha T portion of these outputs are statistically close to uniform. Actually formalizing this intuition isn't very straight, isn't, isn't easy. So the, so core, uh, the core issue here is that Notice that any one of these extractor outputs can actually, uh, you cannot say such a thing about any specific uh, extractor output. For example, we can imagine where the X, they're, they're correlated. For example, we can think about, we pick the, the, pick the sources in such a way that we just pick XI to be zero. And all of the other ones we sample uniformly red. Then if, you, if for XI, it is not possible for you to extract any useful randomness from it because it has a main entropy of only log T. So we cannot say such a thing for any specific extractor, but rather what we can do is actually this selection of these green blocks that are close to, close to uniform. This is actually another random variable that is, with support, that is supported over X. So that is the definition that we formalized and we show that we can actually construct such multi-instance random extractions using, uh, using Hadamard code or read model codes. The constructions here are very standard constructions, but it's our analysis that I think uh, is more interesting to the community. Okay, so with this multi-instance extractor, what can we do? There are a couple of things that, that, that we can do. First of all, we show that it immediately gives us multi-incompressible SKEMPK that corresponds to the incompressible encryptions uh, for multiple users. Here, the, actually, it's very straightforward. First of all, we define what inc multi-incompressible SKE and PKE means. We give a, uh, we give a simulation-based definition. And uh, in fact, we show that if we just simply replace 
the seeded extractor in all of these constructions with a multi-instance randomness director, and pretty much you don't need to change anything else, it immediately gives you the multi-user multi multi case of these incompressible encryptions. So that's really just, you just need to plug that in and everything is good to go. So that is what we show as an application of the multi-instance randomness, randomness extractor. Along the way, we, uh, we also discover some additional results. First of all, as we imagine that we're having multiple users, it also makes sense to consider if we're among a single pair of users, there is, instead of sending one single message between them, they could potentially send a whole bunch of messages between them. We observe that it is actually not possible if you have a fixed secret key size. With a fixed secret, secret key size, it is not possible to support an unbounded number of messages between the same pair of users. But rather, we can only support up to a bounded number of messages between the two users. And we show how to actually adapt the constructions on a previous page to actually allow for these bounded multiple ciphertexts between the same pair of users. Additionally, we explore possible constructions under the random oracle model. So in the random oracle model, what we are what we shown is that you can actually construct a incompressible SKE and also incompressible PKE for an unbounded number of users, as well as unbounded number of ciphertexts between the users. And uh, our constructions achieve optimal key and ciphertext sizes. And here it's interesting because it essentially says that uh, public, key, public key tools might not be necessary to construct a multi-user incompressible SK. So to quickly, quickly summarize our result, uh, from the title, there are two parts. First part, there is the multi-instance uh, multi randomness extraction. So that is the extractor that we define and we've shown how to construct. So that is one of our technical constructions. And the other part of the paper is mainly focused on how we can use such a multi-instance extractor to construct these multi-user incompressible uh, encryptions. And we think this multi-instance multi uh, randomness extraction could be of uh, individual interest uh, for other applications. Thank you. Thank you. Are we have time for questions? Okay. Any questions? Let's thank the speaker again. The next talk is on the paper titled Efficiently Testable Circuits with Without Conductivity by Mersa Hadbag. Subhriti Chakravarti, Stefan Zimbowski, Malgoshata Galashka, Tomash Dizure, Shishtaf Pichak, and uh, Medizal Pilkipa. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm presenting our work, Efficiently Testable Circuits Without Conductivity. So uh, this paper concerns tampering, which has been a subject of a lot of cryptographic work and also for the hardware security. The setting we are considering is, uh, suppose you have a circuit which gets manufactured and then while it's being shipped, uh, an adversary tampers with it. And then when you receive it, you want to know whether it has been tampered or not. And you don't want to uh, open up the circuit and look at it in, in an invasive way, uh, which is, well, invasive, also costly. Uh, and so you want to basically check it by doing just uh, input uh, output checking. And since the input space could be large, it's not efficient to do it on all inputs. And also if, uh, so now if you do in a very restricted set of inputs, uh, and but the circuit is supposed like a SAT instance, a hard SAT instance, then even if the adversary tampers only the last wire, it might be hard to check just by looking at the output. So uh, the previous uh, work which appeared in the ITCS uh, this year, uh, we defined this efficiently testable compiler which takes any circuit C and then compiles into another circuit C hat along with a small set of test uh, instance uh, such that uh, the number of inputs and outputs are increased a little bit, which would be constant. As, uh, and these two circuits are essentially functionally equivalent, which is if we output the C, input the C hat with X uh, with some padded zeros and just restrict the output to uh, what the original output of the length of the original uh, circuit, then they're basically the same. 
Another property they have uh, is this efficiently testable property, which is that for any tampering from certain class, uh, I will define what class we consider, uh, that if for on some input, these two circuits would have behaved differently, the tampered circuit and the honest circuit, then we can check it by actually inputting only from the small test set, right? And uh, the previous, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So the circuit model that we're considering is Boolean circuits with AND, OR, ZOR, and NOT gates. Uh, and the tampering model that we are considering is that uh, the adversary is allowed to tamper on all wires uh, and it can tamper them by uh, either setting it to zero, setting it to one, uh, or toggling, which just flips the it gets zero to one or one to zero or to do nothing. The previous work uh, achieved efficiently testable compiler for all circuits with only constant blow up in the size. Uh, and the the test uh, the the set of test input was also constant, right? So you just needed to check on a few uh, very few inputs to see if that circuit has been tampered. Uh, but a key limitation was uh, something called conductivity assumption. So what is conductivity assumption? It's that um, <clears throat> so if if there is a, a gate with a large fan out. And if you want to apply, uh, if the adversary wanted to apply a tampering on that wire, then it has to, uh, the same, uh, the, the error propagates through all the wires. Uh, but this may not be a realistic assumption for, for just for intuition. If one side of the wire is cut, then it's always zero, while on that other side, the adversary can apply any kind of tampering. So we model this by uh, uh, but basically putting a, a, a copy gate uh, in there and then the adversary is allowed to tamper all three. So yeah, all three of these things independently. Uh, okay, so the, the question was, can we get this ETC without conductivity? Uh, the previous paper, the construction completely breaks down if you do not have this conductive assumption. So the, uh, <clears throat> so uh, in this paper, uh, we wanted to answer this. Uh, unfortunately, for the same notion of ETC, it's, it uh, doesn't seem to be possible. Uh, so we had to allow for uh, two relaxations. So we had to allow basically for randomness. And then uh, the tampering notion was to detect it. It's, it's the same notion, except that the detection probability is now constant instead of, well, it's a smaller constant than one, right? So previously, it was one. Uh, so what the main results we achieve is that we have efficiently testable circuit compiler for all circuits uh, with a constant blow up uh, again. And the number of additional inputs is a little off N, output just like basically constant. And the randomness required is also a little over of N. And you don't have too many queries. And for some concrete parameters, if you have like some two to the 32, uh, the size of the circuit is two to 32, you still need only uh, 482 uh, <clears throat> additional inputs and the number of queries is like less than 200 and still we get a success probability of one by 32. Okay, so how do we get it? Uh, so this I'm gonna define how this compiler outline works. Uh, so first we compile the circuit into a gate cover set. I will come to what gate cover means uh, in a later slide. And then we notice still there is some problem. So we need like a compression to reduce the number of layers. And then we can recursively apply this compression to get the final one circuit as desired. Okay. Mm, so coming to the gate covering set. So what the gate covering set is, uh, it is a, uh, it's a small set of test inputs uh, such that every gate uh, in the circuit has all four combination of values from the, so so a gate like an AND gate will have both zero zero as inputted or one zero one one uh, zero one as shown in the picture, and to achieve this we need to add uh, some extra gates. Uh, we add first like few inputs called this control bits, and uh, we can also add this uh, extra ZOR gates in appropriate places. And this can be done by a single pass algorithm which goes through the circuit topologically and then adds the sort gates appropriate places. So once we achieve this, uh, we get, uh, we can see this uh, key observation that uh, on the, on inputs from the test set, we will, can be, either the output will be wrong or there'll be information loss on some wire. And what does information loss means is that uh, the wire, 
So any wire is said to have information loss if there be two inputs, X and X prime, on which their value in the honest circuit should have differed. But in the tampered circuit, they're actually same, right? Uh, and this information loss, we can detect it by just from in inputs from the test set. So if our test set is small, we can simply input all the possible uh, values from the test set and see if the uh, the honest, the, what we expected as honest value came up or not. And this way we can check the tampering. So, so uh, like my first attempt is to just copy out all the wires. And then if you have information loss on some wire, then the, the, the yellow wires, like the, uh, the copied out wires, the information loss persists on them, right? Because uh, none of the tamperings can change. Once you lose the information, you cannot recover it. That's the, basically the idea. Uh, but this obviously has a problem that this has too many outputs. So we need to somehow compress it. And to compress it, we use this inner product gadget, which basically uh, takes all these wires and inner products them with a random string. Uh, and then we get like basically one output. Uh, this is this requires too much randomness. So we need additional tricks to use reuse the randomness. Uh, so we have a short length of randomness and uh, in interest of time, I will not get into those details. Uh, please take the paper for those things. But uh, eventually, uh, what we need to also prove that once you have this information loss on these yellow wires, right, and that it presses through uh, through the compression layer, and the the lemma we prove is that uh, if there is tampering, uh, if there is information loss on a wire, then it will show up after the compression layer with a probability of at least half. And by this way. Uh, just by testing on the, the, the this small test set, uh, along with uh, some randomness, uh, we can actually detect uh, uh, we can detect the whether there has been information loss or the output is wrong, and this way we can check whether there has been a tap. Um, okay. So a uh, few open problems which will be interesting to you know, see um, in future would be so. I mean, the, we 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 discussed a restricted set of tamperings, right? We simply wire tamperings, but the larger class of tampering attacks, maybe gate tampering, maybe something even uh, bigger than that could be more interesting to see. Or generalizing the circuit model. So in our circuits, there's no state, um, or we are just considering Boolean circuits. So one could consider stateful circuits or arithmetic circuits. And further interesting thing would be if we can find some applications beyond hardware testing and tampering, uh, say in like pure theory, um, that would be great. So thank you. We have a lot of time. Questions? Sure. Um, regarding open problems, uh, you, you use randomness. Do you know that this is necessary? Uh, we don't have a proof, but we think it's necessary. Okay, so that's technically an open problem. Technically open problem, yes. Any other questions? So a question. So uh, in terms of tampering, are there other models um, that people have used, or like, you know, are tampering as well as uh, leakage? Um, like you, you know, you, this, these are probing kind of attacks, right? Your wire probing. Yeah. Are there other things people have considered recently about you know you can read information about multiple wires? I don't know about recently. Like our so hardware community discusses a lot of tampering, but uh, they are a bit different. But like noisy tampering, for instance, like noisy versions of tampering would be it's more realistic rather than where it's persistent forever, but like instead, okay, it shows up at some time with some probability, that'll be interesting. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it presents its own technical challenges of trying to prove things to results. Okay. All right, uh, let's uh, thank Sanjay and Thank you. And uh, we're on to the last talk of the session. Uh, on immunizing backboard PRGs. Uh, the paper uh, is by Marshall Ball, Evgeny Dodis, and Ellie Golden, and Ellie Ogil. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, this is immunizing backdoor serial generators. Uh, this joint work with, with my advisors. Um, so 
I'll begin by saying, you know, what is a PRG? I'm sure you all know, but uh, PRG is a deterministic function, which takes in some uniformly random seed and produces a longer pseudo random seed, which is going to be indistinguishable to a truly random seed. And what this means is that if, you know, Patrick is walking along and he sees a pseudo random seed, he's going to think, oh, that's definitely like a, a random string. Uh, and so in this work, we're going to uh, work with an online uh, variant of pseudorandom generators, which are theoretically equivalent, but practically a bit more relevant. Uh, in an online pseudorandom generator, uh, it's going to output pseudorandom output over the course of many rounds. It's going to take in as its initial state some you know, small uniformly random seed. Uh, and each round is going to output a new state as well as uh, some pseudorandom output. And taken all together uh, over the course of many rounds, the output should be uh, pseudorandom. So uh, in practice, uh, you know, pseudorandom generators are very useful, um, but people in the real world generally uh, don't write their pseudorandom generators themselves. So where did they get them? Uh, and usually how, how most companies work is they trust somebody who's written some you know, pseudorandom generator standard and, and published it online, maybe with proof of security and we'll use it, uh, say from SpongeBob. Uh, and most of the time, SpongeBob is a pretty nice guy, so this has no problem. The pseudorandom generator is you know, all good and all secure. Uh, but what happens if, say, SpongeBob were to be evil? Uh, so evil SpongeBob may, when coming up with his algorithm, store some information uh, about how he came up with the algorithm that will help him plant a backdoor into the PRG, uh, which may give him some advantage in distinguishing it from evil. Uh, and so a bit more formally, uh, we uh, define a notion of backdoored pseudorandom generators where, uh, or there is a notion of backdoored pseudorandom generators um, where uh, the output of a backdoored pseudorandom generator should satisfy two properties. It should be publicly secure. That is, uh, Patrick, if he sees the output of a backdoored pseudorandom generator, should think, oh, that's a uniformly random string. Uh, but evil SpongeBob with his backdoored key, uh, when he sees the output of a backdoored pseudorandom generator, should be able to open up the backdoor and tell, oh, this is definitely came from a PRG. This is not random. Uh, so in fact, uh, backdoor pseudorandom generators exist. Uh, and this has actually happened before uh, in the real world, although it's a long story I'm not going to get into here. Uh, but the main question of our work is how do we actually prevent against these factors? So one kind of simple solution is that you could just you know, build your own PRG from scratch. But unfortunately, uh, most programmers are not cryptographers, and so they're very bad at this. And so this is pretty dangerous. Uh, another solution you could do is you could uh, re-randomize the public parameters or the randomness that's used in coming up with the algorithm. Uh, but when you're just given like a description of an algorithm, you don't really know necessarily what the public parameters are. And so this is not always going to be possible. Uh, so to solve this problem in a, a cleaner way, uh, Dodis et al. in 2015 uh, defined a notion of a immunizer. And immunizer is going to be some function that takes in a backdoor pseudorandom output and turns it into a cleaned up immunized uh, pseudorandom string that no longer has a backdoor. And in particular, an immunizer F is going to take in as input uh, one output from a round of a pseudorandom generator. And if you apply it in an online fashion, then you should immunize the, the pseudorandom. Uh, so in, in particular, if Patrick sees the output of the immunized uh, pseudorandom generator, uh, this should look to him to be uniformly random. And also, if evil SpongeBob, who has the backdoor key, uh, sees the immunized output, this should still look to him to also be uniformly random. That is, uh, evil SpongeBob is sad against an immunizer because now his backdoor key is useless. Uh, one more thing I want to say about this notion is that the same immunizer F should work for any backdoor PRG. Uh, that is, if F is an immunizer, it should work for the PRG with pseudorandom output with the red backdoor or with the purple backdoor, or the yellow backdoor, or even the blue backdoor. Uh, Dodis et al. also shows how to construct uh, these things. Um, they show that a random oracle that has a salt for which the backdoor is not allowed to depend on the salt is a immunizer. And also they show how to build uh, immunizers from something called universal computational extractors, which is a very, very strong cryptographic primitive, which we don't really know how to build from standard assumptions. Uh, so there are two kind of major flaws with, with these constructions and with immunizers in general. Uh, so you can show that uh, immunizers of this form cannot possibly be made uh, deterministic. They have to have some seed that the backdoor does not have access to. 
And we also uh, don't know how to build these from standard model assumptions. Uh, and so a uh, major focus of this work is, is going to be to try and remove the flaws from, from this. And we do this by generalizing to uh, something we call a two immunizer. Uh, so a two immunizer is going to take out an input instead of just one backdoor pseudorandom string. It's going to take in two backdoor pseudorandom strings. And so you can think of these uh, pseudorandom strings as maybe uh, two different runs of a single backdoor PRG on two different uniformly random sets. Uh, and just like an immunizer, uh, a two immunizer is going to take these two strings and move it and turn it into a uh, pseudorandom string without any backdoor uh, in on online fashion. So in particular, one round of a two immunizer will take in the uh, concatenation of one round of both pseudorandom uh, backdoor strings. Uh, so the more focused question of this work is, can we build two immunizers that are simple and deterministic from standard assumptions? Uh, why do we think this is possible? Uh, well, we will uh, turn to look at the backdoored random oracle model, which is somewhat similar. So a backdoored random oracle is a random oracle uh, where the adversary gets arbitrary information about its truth. Uh, and prior work uh, gives some pretty strong evidence that the XOR of two backdoored random oracles is a random oracle without any backdoor. And because a backdoored random oracle is like a very, very idealized notion of a backdoor, we would hope that this result would also translate uh, to our setting of actually backdoor appearance. Uh, so we provide uh, three different results. Our first result is that, unfortunately, uh, XOR is not going to be a two immunizer in our model. Um, and there's, there's an asterisk here because we rely on some cryptographic assumption. Uh, but it's a standard model assumption. Uh, and second of all, we show that a random oracle is a two immunizer, and it's in fact a deterministic uh, two immunizer. Uh, so this gives some heuristic uh, instantiation of a two immunizer. And finally, we give uh, very strong evidence uh, that it's very hard to build immunizers in the standard model, either one immunizer or two immunizers. So the, the first result is that XO is not a, a two immunizer. Uh, and before I, I get into this, I'm going to talk about a, a very simple way to build uh, backdoor PRGs from something called pseudorandom encryption. Pseudorandom encryption is, I guess, what you'd expect. It's just an encryption scheme where ciphertexts are pseudorandom strings. Uh, and what this means is that uh, to the public who doesn't have access to the private key, uh, any ciphertext is going to look like a random string. But to the person with the private key, they can decrypt ciphertext and get back the original message. And note that this, you know, on its surface already sounds a lot like uh, a backdoor PRG, and it's very easy to build backdoor PRGs from pseudorandom encryption. Uh, how you would do it is that evil SpongeBob will publish as its algorithm the uh, public key of the encryption scheme. And then to run the PRG, uh, parties will just encrypt zero under this public. Uh, pseudorandomness of encryption shows that this is a publicly secure PRG. But evil SpongeBob can uh, distinguish outputs from random just by decrypting and see if you get zero. So how are we going to now uh, show that XOR is not a two immunizer? Well, what we'll do is we'll build a backdoor PRG that uh, cannot be immunized by XOR. And in particular, we'll consider what happens if the ciphertexts are somewhat homomorphic. Homomorphism is maybe the wrong word, but it's the best word I, I could come up with. Uh, so what I mean by this is that the encryption uh, if you take two encryptions of the same message under the same public key and you XOR them together, uh, you should get something that's also an encryption of that message under that public key. Uh, if you have an encryption scheme that satisfies this property, then the XOR of two encryptions of zero is also going to be an encryption of zero. And this means that for the backdoored PRG that just outputs an encryption of zero, uh, you're not going to be able to immunize it by using XOR. And so if there exists any encryption scheme that's pseudo-random and satisfies this homomorphism property, then XOR is not going to be a two. And in fact, it's not hard to show that uh, such a scheme can exist based off of a uh, learning parity with noise. Uh, and so we, sh we show that uh, assuming some variant of learning parity with noise, uh, XOR is not going to be a two. So our second result is that a random oracle is a, a two immunizer. Uh, and I'll give a, a quick sketch of, of the reasons why, but maybe not go too much into the details. Uh, so, so the main reason is that uh, no party of the game uh, can actually query uh, both inputs to the random oracle at the same time. Uh, and the intuition behind this is that uh, the output of each pseudorandom generator has to be unpredictable 
unless given the seed, even if you have the secret key. Uh, and otherwise, it's not going to be publicly secure because people can just you know test if there's a collision. Uh, and no party is going to have access to both seeds at the same time, not even the pseudorandom generators themselves. And that's kind of the, the whole key idea. Uh, our final result is that uh, there is evidence against a standard model immunizer. Uh, and what do I mean by a standard model immunizer or standard assumption? I'm going to be talking about uh, falsifiable assumptions or efficiently falsifiable assumptions, which are just assumptions that can be expressed as a cryptographic game with an address. Uh, the, the main, uh, as a preliminary, let me talk about what a, a black box reduction is. So a black box reduction uh, is just going to be uh, a way to prove that some protocol is secure. Um, this is a, a pretty common method. And, and how it works is uh, you take some adversary for your protocol and you show how to, in a black box manner, generically transform it into an adversary for some falsifiable assumption. And so therefore, if the falsifiable assumption uh, holds, then that means that your protocol will be secure. So our third result is to show that you cannot use this proof technique to show that any two immunizer is secure, regardless of what falsifiable assumption you're making. Uh, and since most security proofs are at their heart black box reductions, this shows that it's fairly hard to actually show security of any two immunizers. Uh, note that there's some caveat here that the immunizer must be highly dependent on its inputs, uh, but this is a, a fairly natural restriction and most uh, immunizers that you can come up with would satisfy this, like inner product. Uh, in addition, we also show the same result for uh, one immunizers, and here we no longer need the caveat. Uh, so I'm going to end by talking about something I like to call the uh, Venn diagram of crypto. So in cryptography, uh, there are primitives that practitioners like and primitives that theoreticians like. And in particular, stuff like public key encryption, uh, pseudorandom generators, or uh, collision resistant hash functions, we know how to build these you know, very efficiently, so practitioners are happy. And also, we need to know how to build these from like theoretical assumptions that seem all secure and whatever. So theoreticians. Are. However, uh, something like indistinguishability obfuscation, we know how to build from theoretical assumptions, uh, but we have no clue how to really do this in a practical way that uh, practitioners would be happy. And the same holds for something like uh, fully homomorphic encryption or anything with a quantum output. Uh, but on the other side of things, there are cases where practitioners are happy and theoreticians are not. Uh, for example, uh, SNARDs, uh, we know how to build these you know, from in the random oracle model and, and can do this in a way that has been used in, in practice, but there's no uh, satisfying standard model uh, constructions. And in particular, there is a, a similar black box. Uh, so I guess the main result of this work is to place immunizers also in this practitioner's happy uh, box. Uh, in the sense that we give a heuristic construction of an immunizer just by using random oracle. Uh, but we also show that it's pretty hard to build these from any standard model assumption that theoreticians would be. And yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions? Uh, Do questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so for SNARKs, there's recently been some progress on replacing the random Marco with correlation interactive on hash functions. Have you looked at that at all? Whether you know the same approach could apply to immunizers, or, or um, are we pretty sure that it wouldn't? Um, we didn't look at correlation intractable hash functions in particular. I guess there's not really the same kind of yeah, Shamir type thing here. Um, the previous result looks at universal computational extractors, um, which is kind of somewhat more standard model, but we, we don't really know how to build it in the same ways. But, yeah. Any other questions? What kind of um, random oracle do you use for the proof? Particularly, do you need programmable random oracle or uh, maybe non-programmable would be enough? We don't, uh, I 
don't think we need programming for the random oracle. And in fact, we also do this in the auxiliary input random oracle model. So there's there's several several levels back. I, I suspect that maybe you can even do this without programming in like the, the backdoor random oracle model. Uh, we didn't show this. Any other? Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again and all the speakers of the session. Now we have a coffee break.